Hi everyone, if you're here, that means that you are interested in pursuing genetic counseling. And first I wanna say, you've made a great choice. Genetic counseling is such an interesting and multifaceted career. And you know, now that you're interested, you may be wondering where do I even start in trying to pursue genetic counseling and becoming a genetic counselor. And to that, I would say the first thing you need to know about genetic counseling is that in order to practice, you have to have earned a master's in genetic counseling from an accredited program. And you may be wondering, what is accreditation, accredited, what does that mean? So um, the term accreditation for programs in terms of genetic counseling comes from the Accreditation Council for Genetic Counseling, which is an organization that basically exists to ensure the quality of genetic counseling education. So what they do is they do sort of this review process of programs that are interested in becoming accredited to ensure that their curriculum, their rotations, all of that stuff is squared away um, so that the students are getting the education they need in order to pass their board exams and become board certified. Becoming board certified is the only way to actually practice as a genetic counselor. So it's really important that when you're doing your program search, you're making sure that that program is accredited by the council, has that stamp of approval so that you can sort of proceed into the career. To find out which programs are accredited and not accredited, the council actually keeps an updated list on their website. So what you have to do is you go to the website and there's two ways you can look at it. You can look at the interactive map that they have, which will show you programs by state, or they have a comprehensive PDF that will list out all of the programs that are accredited and as well as the programs that are in the process of being accredited. So those are the ways that you can find out all the programs that you have at your disposal and start your search from there. Before you launch into your search, I think it's important that you consider what aspects are important to you in selecting a program. And thinking about this before you start will help you more easily narrow down the programs as you're searching instead of sort of just looking to look and then having to go back th through them again um, once you know what's important to you. So there are actually a lot of factors that could play a role in what program you choose. And sometimes you don't know what factors are important to you until you start looking at programs and seeing what they have to offer. That's why I've went ahead and collected a list of factors that could be important to you from my personal experience and from experiences of others who have applied. Just as a warning, this is quite a beefy list, so I'm going to sort of rattle them off and I'll put a screen up that has them all listed out at the end so you don't have to, you know, rush in taking notes on all of them or anything like that. I will put a screen up that has them all bullet pointed at the end for you, but let's just jump right into it. So that list includes the location of the program. That one is actually really important to a lot of people. Some people are geographically limited, so... Um, they're looking at states sort of like in their home state and surrounding their home state. If you're not too concerned and can move anywhere, this might be less of a factor to you. That was sort of the case for me. I was willing to move anywhere. But the location of the program can be very important. Finances are also another factor that are commonly really important to people when they're looking into programs. And that can stem all the way from tuition, work study opportunities, scholarship opportunities, costs of living. So there are more financial considerations than just the tuition. Um, so those are important to keep in mind if that is something that is important to you um, and your financial situation. The program curriculum is also something to look at for some people. Due to the accreditation sort of process, a lot of the program curriculums are actually quite similar, but there are certain aspects to pro programs that are unique. For example, some of those things could be, do you want a program where all the classes are specifically catered to genetic counseling students? Or do you want a program that has certain classes that are integrated in other uh graduate study fields. Like for example, um, the program that I eventually matched to, which is Rutgers, um, they have a couple psychosocial classes and their human genetics class, for example, is actually combined with the medical students. So in your human genetics class, you'll also be joined by their medical students and you'll be in that class together. 
there is a summer class called Lost Acro Across Lifespan, which I'm really excited about, um, but that's actually with the counseling graduate students as well. I personally like that. Some people might want a more catered, I guess, um, curriculum experience. So that's something to keep in mind. Another factor that may be important in distinguishing between programs is their rotation opportunities. This factor is more variable, I would say, than the curriculum. So all your programs through the process of accreditation will have rotation opportunities in the big three fields. That is prenatal, cancer, and pediatric but they could also have specialty clinic opportunities that aren't present in other programs. One example that comes to mind for me is that through my interview and research experiences and looking into programs, uh, for example, Northwestern is one program that has psychiatric rotations, and that's actually pretty unique in programs. When I was looking at programs as a neuroscience major, I wanted to make sure that the program I went to had neurogenetics opportunities. So that was a factor for me in deciding what programs to apply and eventually go to. So that's something to keep in mind. Another factor you could consider in your search is program extracurricular opportunities. So what I mean by that are supplemental activities that are ingrained into the program, such as you know, journal clubs, conference attendance. One that I was looking at in particular was the LEND program. That stands for Leadership, Education, and Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities. That's an extracurricular opportunity that some programs participate in where you, you know, get experience with children with disabilities and have hands-on experience that way. Um, so that could be something that you look at in determining what places you're more interested in than others. Program research opportunities is another factor that might be important to you. Uh, most programs have a capstone or research requirement for completing the program. So that could be something you look into depending on your sort of attraction to research or not. Some people are really excited by research. Some people, it's not their thing. So some programs may be really interested in research and you might not be. So that's something to keep an eye out for. Program dual degree options is another factor. This is actually not super common in genetic counseling, but there are a few programs that have a dual degree option. One that immediately comes to mind is Northwestern famously has the bioethics and genetic counseling dual degree. An important note um, to keep in mind about that is that there's obviously an increase in price with those dual degree programs, but if that's something you're really interested in, um, that could be a criteria for you. Program affiliation with hospitals and medical schools may also be something you look out for that could have an impact on your rotation opportunities and things like that. Class size is another factor. Genetic counseling programs famously have pretty small class sizes in general that can range from like six people all the way to the top is like 25 to 30. So that is the general range of class size. And if that's important to you, that's something to keep in mind. For me, I was looking for a larger class size just for more opportunities um, to interact with fellow students, just to have more perspectives in the classroom. So that could be something that's important to you as well. Or you could prefer a smaller class size so that you have more one-on-one -on -one attention. Researching the faculty of each program could also be something that could factor into your program interests. If there are certain faculty members that you would love to work with and interact with, then that's something to keep in mind. School reputation, rankings, prestige is also something that you could look into as a factor that might be important. But I will say keep in mind that a program's or a school's undergraduate reputation can be quite different than their genetic counseling and graduate reputation. And by that, I mean in the field of genetic counseling, there actually is not really a hierarchy of, you know, good programs and bad programs. At the end of the day, you do get the same board certification. So this is actually a factor that in genetic counseling, I believe is actually much less important than maybe another field. Another thing that's really important to note for your genetic counseling programs is their prerequisite requirements. 
This is because I think these act as kind of exclusion criteria depending on what you have and haven't done. For example, a lot of programs are straying away from requiring the GRE, but some programs still require it. For me, because most programs didn't require it, I didn't take it, but that meant that I couldn't apply to programs that did require it. So that's something to keep in mind. Another thing is some schools require you to take a specific embryology course prior to matriculation. So prior to matriculation means that you don't have to have taken it at the time of application, but you do need to take it before you attend that school. But if that's something you're not interested in, then maybe you shouldn't apply to those programs. If that's something you're okay with, then you can go ahead and apply to those programs. Diversity is another factor that might be important, especially if you're a BIPOC student or a member of a minority group. Unfortunately, the state of genetic counseling right now is very much white, uh, middle-class woman, which, you know, someone like me, but I will say that I'm really excited. The field is really making an effort to include more voices. So that past point I made about schools not requiring the GRE anymore, that is an effort towards in inclusion since a lot of research is coming out that uh, standardized testing like that isn't really indicative of success, but rather is more of a monetary barrier for people and people who can afford to get, you know, pre-test help are likely to do better on that than people who might not have the resources to do that. So that is the reasoning for taking away the GRE. Another thing is that most interviews for genetic counseling are conducted virtually now on Zoom. That's another effort to make the interview process more accessible to people. Um, I have a whole blog post about this topic actually, the topic of diversity in genetic counseling and what we can do to move to a point where, you know, people like me aren't the necessarily the norm, you know. So if you're interested in learning about you know, the state of genetic counseling in terms of diversity and what we might be able to do to do better. You can go ahead and check that out. Shameless uh, self promo here. Um, but yeah, um, but in terms of the application process, um, you might want to look out for, you know, does this program seem like it values diversity? Do they have a diversity statement? What are they doing to include more voices? What does their, you know, class look like, for example? Do you see yourself in that class? Those are things to keep in mind. The last three I'm going to include as sort of one point, but that's gonna be board passing rate, job placement rate, and alumni network. Those are sort of like logistical things as to the career advantage you see yourself gaining from this program. For example, um, Sarah Lawrence is the oldest program and the most established, and they have by far the most graduates from that program. So if having a large alumni network is important to you, then that might be a program you're interested in. For board passing rate and job placement rate, those are things that just ensure that you're you know, ready and prepared after graduating from that program to launch into the field. So having you know, high stats in those categories can be a draw. Okay, so here's that list for you as promised at the end here with all of these factors. Try to keep in mind which ones jumped out to you. It's okay if all of these factors are something you consider, but for example, some might be more important than others. So keeping that in mind will help you narrow down your programs and make decisions in terms of your final list. Once you've collected your list of things that are really important to you, you can jump into program research. And this looks different for a lot of people, mostly depending, I think, on if you have location restrictions or not. For example, for me, I was willing to move anywhere, so I actually looked at every single program. I think the list, um, the total list of programs right now is like 56, 59, so I actually did look at all those programs really extensively to make sure that I'm going into this with as much information as possible and not skipping out on any programs that could be a good fit for me. But if you are limited by location, obviously you're going to be looking at 
the programs that are closer in proximity to you and maybe not the entire list. Like I mentioned before, you can jumpstart that through the Accreditation Council's interactive map. For me, I use the PDF and you can go ahead and navigate to the program websites to learn all about them, start learning where they stand on those factors that are important to you. And I would keep a very open mind when you start this process and really note any program that you could possibly see yourself interested in and then narrow down from there. Narrowing down the list once you have like a good list going can actually be quite difficult, but that's why I recommend thinking about those factors that are important to you and really being picky once you get down to the nitty gritty of having your final list. And in terms of your final list, really how many programs you include on that is up to you in terms of your financial situation and you know the time and effort it takes to complete and submit all those applications. But you know, as a general rule, the more programs you apply to, the more chance you have at matching. But it is important to keep in mind that there is sort of a, a time and effort and financial cost to each program you apply to. And you need to make sure that you would be able to, for example, attend all the interview invites that you get or, you know, pay for all the applications that you do. I believe that for matched applicants, the average number of ranks um, they submit is around eight. Ranks is different technically from programs, but for me, that's what I move forward with is that I wanted to apply to around seven or eight schools just to make sure that I am capitalizing on the chance of matching, but also keeping the price affordable and keeping those interviews manageable. I have collected feedback from other people who applied in the cycle who, you know, after receiving all their interview invites and things did express that they probably should have applied to less programs just because of the time associated with attending all the interviews and things like that. But yeah, it really depends on your personal preference and time that you're willing to dedicate to that. But in general, those are all the tips and guidance and general advice I have for what accreditation is, how to research programs and narrowing down your lists and all these other factors you have to consider in creating your final list of programs you're going to apply to. Be sure to let me know if I left anything out that you're wondering about in the comments below and I will be happy to answer that and maybe even make a follow-up video if there's enough that I missed. I don't know. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for tuning in and be sure to leave a like if this was helpful. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you next time.